Hello, everybody. The best investment in the world is investment in your mind. So, good evening, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and managed by LifeChamp. So, today we are very excited to be welcoming this topic, which is the rise of industrial IoT. Now, some of you here may wonder what actually is IoT. Now, IoT refers to Internet of Things. That means when uh, this era picks up, right, then we can see a lot more electronic device that can talk to each other. Okay, how do they, how do they talk to each other? Uh, I think our speaker today will explain to you what is in IoT, and in particular, what is its application in the industrial sector, and what are the companies listed on Bursa Malaysia, and how can they benefit in this supply chain of industrial IoT. So today we are going to have a deep delve into the supply chain of industrial internet of things. All right, so today the speaker has prepared a great content to share with you. So without further ado, let me just quickly go to a disclaimer. So whatever we share on this webinar is only for educational purpose. In no way that I give any recommendation to buy or sell any companies. So uh, we will do case studies in this webinar. So there's no any, uh, call, uh, buy call or sell call on this, any of this company that we do case study on, all right? So if you decide to make any investment decisions after this webinar, so you do it at your own risk. Allow me to introduce our speaker today, David. Uh, I think, of course, uh, he asked me to keep it short. So uh, David is the founder of Spiral Thinker Group, Sandhya Perhat, and he is now a full-time investor and dedicates his time and resources to nurture the youth in financial literacy. Now, he's often invited to speak in broker seminars, webinars, as well as other Bursa endorsed events, and his professional comments and opinions on value investing are featured in business publications like Focus Malaysia. Now, David also provides consultation services in value investing and advanced portfolio strategies for high net worth individuals. So today, uh, David is back again. Last year, David talked about the overview of semiconductor industry and talked about the rise of 5G. And today, David uh, will talk about the rise of industrial internet of things. So without further ado, let me hand over to the founder of Spiral Thinker Group, David Poe. Yo, 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 Shane, thank you very much for that colorful introduction. It's good to be back. Um, yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Chun Xian Life Champ as well as Busan Malaysia for inviting me back again to talk about a topic that is really uh, one, of our, one of my passion. Uh, it's good to be back to talk about you know, technology and semiconductor industry. And you know that I, I, I really like this industry uh, in terms of, you know, as a, as a former engineer myself, as well as for the outlook of, 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 of um, our Malaysian economy, right? Because as you all know, semiconductor is really the heart of Malaysian uh, manufacturing uh, uh, economy. And then moving forward, I think it's going to be more important. Yeah, so last year, like what uh, Chun Xie has mentioned, we talk about 5G and we talk about emergence of, you know, the technology, IoT, we talk about automotive. So I think it is a, a natural progression for us to talk about the next, um, you know, the next uh, big thing when it comes to, you know, the, the things that 5G can enable. And that's why we have this topic tonight about the industrial IoT. Yeah. So um, what, what I have in front of you are the... Um, Topics that I'm going to talk about, recap uh, of the 5G top of the 5G that we talked about last year. Um, then we move on to the value creation as well as opportunities IoT, uh, promising business case in the IoT alone. Uh, then we we'll have a look, have a quick uh, with on the semiconductor players, the global players uh, in this space. Then last but not least, uh, which I think what is everyone is waiting for, we're going to do three case studies in KLSE stock tonight. Uh, that uh, dabbles into IIoT. Three case studies, yeah? so make sure that you uh, stay tuned until the end. Okay, um, before that, uh, just a disclaimer, uh, just, you know, just to add on to what Chun Sen mentioned, what I'm sharing tonight is purely on my own opinion. Now, of course, the research as well as the slides are not just done by myself. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between myself and my team, Alpha Research at SpiralThinker.com. Uh, so, uh, 
Uh, heads up to them. Thank you very much for helping me with this. Now, uh, without much further ado, let's move on to the recap of 5G. Now, last year we talked about 5G and you know that you know, 5G is not the end in mind. In fact, it is just an enabler of a lot of new technologies to, to come, you know. So naturally, um, automotive, uh, EV, autonomous vehicle is one of them, definitely. Then um, the, the next thing that we, we, we cannot um, ignore is actually the IoT as well as the Industrial 4.0 that will enhance the productivity you know, of, uh, of, of humankind as well as also our society in general. Yeah? So, <clears throat> but to a lot of us, um, you know, when we hear about IoT, right, we, 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 most of the time we think about uh, you know, our phones, our TV, smart TVs, our wearables, um, you know, our smart devices at home. In fact, these days, right, if you, even if you don't, do not have a smart TV, you just have an LED TV or plasma TV, right? If you still have one of those at home, as long as you have a HDMI port at the back, at the panel, you can buy a, a Google Chromecast or you can buy a MI TV stick, Put it on and then you can turn your LED TV into a smart TV, you know, so you can directly link it to the internet. You can even download apps from Google. And uh, these days you can also have a lot of uh, these uh, wearables like smart watches to monitor your health. Uh, I think these days, you know, with COVID, a lot of people are, um, are worried about their, their, their well-being, you know, especially I know uh, even my neighbors around here. They are talking about buying oximeters, right? And I said, hey, I'm in pulse of oximeters. I said, hey, why don't you get a Huawei Band 6, you know, because it comes with all these cool features, including the pulse oximeter and the price is, and the price is uh, quite affordable. Now, all these things are what we call the Internet of Things for the consumer space. In fact, there's another branch of the Internet of Things, which are... Uh, Perhaps due to its uh, technicality, not a lot of people know about this, but it is called the Industrial Internet of Things, right? So uh, in short, it's called IoT. Uh, so it, it encompasses the things, uh, the smart devices, which are used in factories, you know, in energies, in utilities, in machine-to-machine -machine communication, in smart cities, even in your smart cars in the future, right? So on and so forth, right? So in in, in this regard, actually, uh, the words are interchangeable. The names Industrial Revolution 4.0, uh, IOT, in fact, even to the extent of smart manufacturing, right, they refer to the same thing. So tonight, if I'm talking, suddenly I'm talking about IOT, I'm talking about in, Industrial 4.0, they basically mean the same thing, yeah? So what is Industrial 4.0? As you can see from the uh, very nice uh, uh, chart here, well, Industry 4.0 refers to a new phase in the industrial revolution, one, two, three, and four, that focuses heavily uh, on automation, on machine learning, and real-time data processing. But in, uh, in Industry 4.0, what, what is very um, uh, special or very uh, crucial is actually the interconnectivity, all right? Interconnectivity of the machines or the processes to the internet. And as I mentioned before, uh, Industry 4.0 is interchangeable to Industrial Revolution 4.0, IOT, right? It marries the physical um, connection of productivity as well as the pro uh, operations to machine learning, to the machines, to smart digital technology, to big data, to AI, right? To create a more holistic and um, more advanced connected ecosystem for you know, businesses, manufacturers to focus on the processes as well as supply chain management, yeah? So that is industry 4.0 to you. Um, um, you know, there is a need to enhance connectivity as well as access real-time analytics to improve the processes, right? So when you talk about I Industry 4.0, uh, there are a few jargons that uh, you got to know. I think some of you, I think some of these jargons or names are very pretty common already, like, you know, big data, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, cloud computing. Perhaps one of the... Uh, Perhaps I just want to talk about a little couple of things. Maybe I just annotate for a while. Spotlight, I hope you can see this. Yeah. So maybe I just want to highlight about M2M, uh, which is more, you know, uh, related to internet of industry, internet of things. M2M refers to machine to machine, right? So machine will be talking to machine uh, thanks to the connectivity. Then there's another thing called the CPS. And CPS is actually a very uh, fundamental a uh, element or feature of the industry 4.0, which stands for uh, cyber physical systems. 
Now, you know, in a cyber physical system, as the name implies, cyber refers to internet, physical systems refers to, you know, the machines, right? Basically, it encompasses, you know, sensors uh, uh, to your processors, then back to internet, you know, uh, the core network, then the processors, and then, I mean, they process the data, then they feedback with the required, you know, uh, 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 events or the activities that need to be uh, executed, right? So in on that part of the cycle, then we have the actuators. Now, all this ecosystem forms the cyber physical systems, which I'll be talking a little bit more later on, right? So again, just remember, uh, in, Industry 4.0 emphasizes on digital technology and connectivity on the manufacturing process, okay? Now, of course, in a few years later, you know, down the road, we will hear about Industry 5.0, 6.0. Hopefully, I'll, I'll still be back here to talk about it with you guys, yeah? Okay? Um, then, uh, yeah, so this is another recap of the, one of the slides that I talked about during my 5G webinar uh, last year. Yeah, and um, the, the, the gist of this is to show that actually 5G is not just about enhanced mobile broadband. It's not just about having a uh, much faster speed. It's not just about, you know, being able to download uh, movies in a uh, couple of seconds. In fact, 5G, the, the use case is so vast, right? As uh, if, you can't re if you don't remember, please go back to, I mean, I, I think Chun-Sen, Shane is, is sharing the slides. Yeah, yeah. So Shane uh, uh, shared the YouTube link on the chat. So maybe you can uh, save it, bookmark it, and watch it later. But coming back here, you know, 5G, the, the, the potential is so huge. And in fact, we are just really scr just scratching the surface as of now. Now, um, if you recall properly, actually 5G, the more advanced use cases include the massive machine type communication, so what we call MTC, right? This is where your machine to machine communication will be more, uh, will, will be very relevant, right? Then we've got the ultra reliable low latency communications for advanced manufacturing, for autonomous monitoring, smart manufacturing, so on and so forth. But at the heart of it all, uh, as you can see here, so I just, uh, hold on, uh, yeah. So I just prepared a very nice, um, animation for you guys. Now, a lot of the process, as you can see, of course, industry 4.0 will not happen overnight. It won't, it will not happen, you know, in one or two years, it is actually a process. Now, as you can see on the bottom picture here, um, what can happen right now for the, in the, in the industry 4.0 are things like the process automation that do not require such a low latency in terms of uh, less than one millisecond. As you can see here for process automation, uh, some of the processes in the manufacturing, in the production line, right? That you know, can be automated right away with uh, the current industry 4.0 implementation, right? Then we've got the, uh, uh, then we can do in, in fact, uh, uh, this automated guided vehicle or what we call AGVs. Uh, these are very uh, uh, more becoming more and more common these days. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the YouTube videos uh, by Alibaba or Tiny, you know, or, or Amazon, right? Whereby they've got these very cute uh, flat uh, uh, vehicles on the floor, you know, moving on their own, uh, uh, moving the packages around in the warehouse, right? These are some of the examples of AG, A, AGVs. Then we've got remote control. Then again, as 5G becomes more mature, right? Um, then we've got uh, more advanced IO, uh, industry 4.0 applications like smart grid, you know, tactile internet, motion control, factory automation, medical, so on and so forth. Yeah. So this takes time. Yeah. And and you know, um, in fact, even now, actually, the 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 acceleration of IoT is uh, is actually quite amazing, as you can see here. Um, this is a uh, report by IoT Analytics. It says that in 2020, for the first time, uh, there are more IoT connections than there are non-IoT uh, connections like smartphones and laptops, you know, which means that there are more smart home devices, connected cars, uh, smart watches, uh, industrial equipment, uh, IoT, right? More uh, than smart home, smartphones, computers, and so on. And in fact, they predict, right, that actually... Um, by 2020, by 2025, it is expected that there'll be more than 30 billion LT connections, which means every <clears throat> um, four LT devices per, plan, uh, per person in the entire planet. That's how uh, big this potential is. So um, again, 
this is just, just to show the importance of connectivity uh, in the implementation of IoT. Now, I just want maybe to highlight a little bit here that actually IoT do not just depend on 5G alone. Uh, there is this. Um, so in general, the connectivity is split to two schools. Uh, on the left is actually the cellular IoT. Now, in fact, IoT do not really need 5G. In fact, it can also run on 4G or 3G or even 2G because IoT, uh, these uh, small devices, they normally do not transmit meet very high uh, data or they do not require a uh, very big bandwidth but they do require consistent connectivity all right uh, to be able to communicate to uh, the, from the devices to the edge to the core network okay now on the other end we got this lp the L, sorry lwpa which stands for low power wide area network and this is more relevant uh, especially for the private network or for the manufacturing space now in so in this L, lwpa right we've got two subcategories of uh, connectivity one is the license and the unlicensed one now the licensed one uh, we have no uh, nblt which stands for narrow band lt uh, ltem which stands for lte machine uh, type communications as what i mentioned earlier on then we've got other unlicensed uh, spectrum or unlicensed uh, um, this technology uh, like LoRa or sigfox right now um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about this uh, in the future webinars when we more talk about 5G as well as connectivity for IoT. But tonight we want to focus on the industrial IoT. Yeah? So let's move on to the value creation uh, as well as opportunities in uh, industrial IoT. But first, let's take a look at the IoT stack diagram. Now, don't worry too much about this picture. Uh, I know some of you might maybe scratch your head. Oh, what is this? You know, so technical. Now, there is a reason why I need to show you this. Before I show, I maybe mean, before I show share with you what are the opportunities, I need to tell you, or I need at least to introduce the 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 the, the gist of what the IoT stack diagram looks like. Okay. Now, um, the IoT stack diagram, as I mentioned, right? First of all, in, in the IoT ecosystem, you've got to have things that that you know uh, record or measure data from the physical world, and that is where the sensors come in. So, if you've got different types of sensing uh, uh, equipment like location sensors, uh, you know, image sensors, uh, image sensors, uh, physical sensors, which may include pressure, which may include uh, you know, uh, environmental like uh, uh, pollution uh, or gas sensors, so on and so forth. Then um, we, we, of course, there must be a communication element as well as the edge computing. Um, not everything we pass on to the core network because, you know, it, the connectivity may be too long. Uh, a lot of this processing power or this processing, uh, this function will be taken by the edge computing. Now in the edge network, normally uh, we will require very high performance computing HPCs. Uh, this is where uh, uh, companies like Broadcom plays a big role. All right, now of course we've got the sensor pre-processing and the sensor fusion right now. A lot of things can actually be processed at this layer and then sent back to the IoT ecosystem um, to actually to the actuators or to the machines to actually uh, to activate them to do the mitigation um, you know uh, uh, events right like for example uh, maybe they sense something wrong with the machine so they need to stop the production and then at the, at the, at the edge network when they process it they send the signal to the actuator or back to the IoT ecosystem to stop the production. That could happen as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, of course, uh, we must have a, com uh, a stable communication layer, uh, which may be, uh, which will include wireless modules, gateway processing. Then we've got the infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure is where we've got the microprocessors, uh, microcontrollers, data center to perform all the analytics, okay? Uh, now, the, the, the boxes without colors uh, actually indicate the Greenfield or the new areas where there are a lot of opportunities to, to look at, you know, uh, to explore in the world of IoT. So that would that would that would encompass, you know, um, the platforms. You know, nowadays we hear a lot of platform as a service, a lot of things as a service, right? So this is where where this is. Uh, analytics applications and uh, uh, many types of services. And last but not least, in IoT, actually security plays a very important role. In fact. Mm, security is one of the major issues uh, of concern when it comes to the implementation of IoT. But for tonight, of course, uh, we're not going to talk too much about these other layers. In fact, we're just going to focus more on the semiconductor, yeah? Because we want to bring back, you know, what are, where are the investing opportunities in Malaysia? Okay, now this is just a snapshot, a very quick one of the IoT semiconductor, uh, you know, how, how, 
how how it plays out in the ecosystem. Now, as you can see here, this is basically a block diagram of how a typical semiconductor looks like. So, um, you know, in the IoT uh, uh, ecosystem, now where as I mentioned, we've got the sensors a module to take in you not. Know, to, to measure all this data from the physical world, translate to electric signals, okay? Then whether you these signals will, will, will pass on to the edge for pre-processing or all the way to the cloud, where we have uh, cloud-based processing or for, for sto uh, storage uh, purposes. Then, uh, you know, this is where you need the software, the ecosystem connectivity to support this. Then the signals, I mean, the, the, the decision will be sent back to, to, the, to, the, to the machines uh, to translate into, to be actuated into physical, you know, uh, actions of for maybe for mitigation or for improvement of the process. And this is what uh, forms the IoT control loop. Basically, sensors take in data from the world and then on the output, of this uh, IoT ecosystem is actually the actions to be taken. And this is where you need things uh, with motor, uh, maybe with lighting, uh, with, a, uh, with power management, so on and so forth. And there's a multitude of opportunities around here as well. In fact, we talk, we talk about this, I think uh, last year during the automotive webinar, right? You can have a look at it if you are free, if you want to. Now then in the value chain, right? The, uh, in the distribution of you know, where are the opportunities are, right? You can see here the highlighted, uh, uh, the boxes in pink, uh, sorry, I forgot to include the connectivity. In fact, connectivity is also part of this. And it, it you know, in terms of the value chain, the distribution, right? It, it commands, I mean, there can be as high as 50 to 65% of the entire uh, IoT value chain actually sits on the hardware. Basically, this is just hardware. I'm, we're not talking about software because software, as, as if you look at the IoT stack here, right? Actually, these are, this is where a lot of greenfield opportunities are, but the existing semiconductor players, they mostly um, um, contribute to these uh, colored uh, boxes here, right? That's why it is important for us to understand the IoT stack. Right, so there are in even without looking at the security layer, without looking at the software and ecosystem layer, right? There are already a lot of investment opportunities, and that is what I want to drive at on this slide. Okay, now of course, um, <clears throat> in the semiconductors, um, the building, the basic building block of IoT is this little thing called the MCU. Um, uh, I talk about this again uh, during the automotive session last year. I think it was back in uh, October or November. Uh, just to recap, in case you guys forgot, MCU without sounding too technical, right? Um, it's just, you know, a very basic processor. So it's not like an Intel Pentium processor or your advanced computer chips, right? It is like a very reduced, um, very simple computer chip that is very small that do not require a lot of power. In fact, a lot of things that we use these days have MCUs, including your mouse, you know, uh, including the basic uh, modules of your car, of your car, you know, uh, and, and, and your computers have, will have a lot of MCUs. Then um, in fact, like your, in your, in your car, your wipers may have the MCU in the future, right? So, um, and these MCUs are important, all right, because, you know, in IoT, as you, as you can see here, it's really about the, um, the MCU will play a big role here, all right, as well as the processing, right? Because, you know, uh, you need to, you need the, mic the microcontroller need to tell the system what to do, uh, very basic functions. Now, of course, the, the, the opposite, I mean, sorry, the higher layer, the higher uh, 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 of MCU is called the CISC. Now, MCU is a RSIC family. It belongs to R R RISC family, risk or what we call reduced instruction set computer, as opposed to the com uh, uh, complex uh, instruction set computer, right? This is more for advanced chips and uh, processors, right? Then uh, on, on this chart here, as you can see, right, actually um, the MCU for the IoT market, right? The penetration of the uh, IoT MCU, right? Is actually uh, climbing very steadily. And in fact, by 2025, they estimate that one third for every, one out of every three uh, MCU uh, components uh, manufacturer right, are actually for some sort of IoT or industrial IoT application. So you can see how important this is, yeah? Um, then um, of course, uh, we need to also understand, you know, the four foundation technologies, uh, very basic foundation technologies, or what um, what uh, makes the IIoT uh, uh, 
um, a work, right? So again, uh, I cannot stress enough, IoT is really a lot about connectivity, right? And then uh, to connect what? To connect data that you, uh, you know, you, you, you uh, generate or you measure from your sensors, right? Then you, you have to pass it through. Whether you, you can use blockchain as well, there are so many things that can be used, uh, technologies that can be, you know, tech, uh, on top of, of this IoT. Um, then the, how, how we read this is after you connect the data, that, so there will be some sort of processing at that layer even, right? Then you pass it on to the analytics. Now, this analytics can sit on the edge network or it can sit on the core network. But most of the time, uh, in order to save uh, uh, processing power as well as to increase the speed, the response time, right? A lot of this function is carried on the edge layer. All right, the edge computing layer. And this is where some even advanced analytics are being, uh, are, are being uh, uh, um, Process here. Uh, in fact, the machines can learn, uh, can adapt itself, you know, to the changing environment. All right. Then we have, of course, uh, when we have machine learning, there will be some sort of artificial intelligence involved. Then the output of this, as I mentioned, will actually go to the human machine interaction. All right. Now, IoT, the one of the key uh, uh, points is actually to reduce the um, dependency of human labor. Now, as we as we know. Um, you know, the COVID-19 really opened up, really opened up a can of worms, right? You know, when suddenly there's a lockdown and people cannot go to work, right? Suddenly, a lot of the manuf uh, pro manufacturing processes halted because there's nobody on, on the factory in the factory to supervise or to work, right? So industry um, uh, 4.0 is actually, so COVID-19 actually accelerates the 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 importance or the adoption of uh, industry 4.0. And this is where human uh, machine interaction comes into play, uh, whereby we have uh, a lot of things like virtual and augmented reality, you know, robotics, uh, arm, you know, automation, the AGVC I mentioned before, um, chatbots, RPA, robotic process automation, all right? Now, um, if you look at this, right, this is uh, some of the things are pretty cool here. So this is a band, you know, where uh, you can actually track your, your workers or, or you know, there's a, a QR code here, or, all right? Then we've got the AGVs that is moving around the factory's uh, 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 floor to carry goods or to carry a work in progress products. Then we've got the robotic arms to actually uh, replace uh, human labor. And here, uh, this is something like a Google Glass, right? Actually, this is an AR Glass augmented reality. I'm not sure if you guys have seen movies, you know, whereby, you know, some spy movies where you put on a glass and you've got a lot of this computer, um, you know, text coming out, you know, to, to see, uh, to, to identify who the person is in front of you or who, what the object is in front of you, right? And this is really happening in the industry, I, industrial IoT, right? Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, factories uh, in developed countries, they are already doing this. Right, where these uh, 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 augmented reality enabled glasses are being uh, used to identify a lot of things or the processes right, in the production line. Now, of course, um, the, the highest layer is actually when uh, more advanced engineering is required, where, you know, um, where a lot of these processes can be, can be improved. Uh, of course, this, this, process, this IoT would generate massive data, which can be actually further uh, be used to further enhance the processes or even to come up with more innovative products. Yeah. So th basically, these are the four foundation technologies uh, based on McKinsey's uh, 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 the, this uh, document. So I think uh, later on, you will see uh, as I go along the case studies, you will understand why this is important. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm I'm going a little bit fast on these uh, three three four topics because I want to give more time for the case studies later, which I'm sure I, I, I assure you is worth it. Yeah, so let's move on to the some of the use uh, business cases, promising business cases in IIoT. Okay, now I want you to close your eyes and imagine, right? Um, whatever you see in the movies these days, right, about futuristic, uh, uh, you know, a world, a society, right? I tell you, it's happening. <laughs> in fact, thanks to COVID, COVID nineteen, actually, a lot of this this digital transformation is being accelerated. Now, um, what I have in front of me or, or, or in front of a screen is, you know, a very a typical. Um, implementation of how the new, the future uh, factory will look like. Okay, now it, as you can see here, actually it just does not 
include, you know, it does not end at the factory or the production space. In fact, the, in a smart manufacturing in the future, right, will encompass things like, you know, uh, your, your global warehouse logistics facilities, uh, your customer interaction, and how this data can be used in the R&D process or, you know, in, a, uh, uh, in the uh, stock uh, supply chain management, so on and so forth. And as you can see in the picture here, actually one of the things, one of the key things that I want to highlight here is actually you can see all this, uh, this, uh, this diagram here, right? It, it infers that in industry, internet of things, interconnectivity is very, very crucial, right? A lot of these processes are interconnected. Now, they may not use um, you know, these uh, cables anymore. In fact, everything should be wireless. With 5G, with the connectivity that I talk about, the LPW, the L, uh, low power, L, LPWA, um, these uh, uh, access technologies, right? So this is a typical uh, you know, example of how future manufacturing will look like. You know? Whereby I'm, I'm sure, in fact, it's, it's quite interesting that this color is in blue, all right, because there's this term called the light out manufacturing, whereby the entire production process can can we can be without lights because everything is done by the machines. All right, uh, I think this is a new term you can go and Google it out. It's called lights out manufacturing process. And in order to do that, in order to enable that, we must have all these machines being able to talk to each other, be able to talk to the to the to the uh, to the computer network, all right, to be able to function properly and as one whole unit. Okay. Um, this is another example or another uh, you know uh, case study of uh, sorry another um, this uh, example of a um, smart manufacturing for semiconductor. Now later on I'll show you which are the key industries that are adopting uh, IIoT in a big way. I think just after this slide and you understand why this is. Now there are a lot of industries or manufacturing processes that are very sensitive to you know. That, that requires very high precision engineering, meaning you know uh, just a, maybe a little bit of error on your chemi uh, on your composition or in a pro manufacturing process on the alignment of the of the materials or of, of the components, right? Will, will will cause a very uh, may may if impact your entire you know product at the end, right? And this will include you know like your cars, you know actually cars is actually a very uh, requires very high precision uh, when it comes to the, the assembly, right? You cannot imagine if you buy a car which is uh, maybe uh, have an out of alignment in, in on the wheels. Can you imagine the impact, right? So semiconductor is the same because chem semiconductors deals with very um, small, very fine matters, even up to you know the nanometers, right? So the humans. Uh, can no way humans can do it so you require a lot of machines you require a lot of equipment to do these processes to do this uh, uh, manufacturing uh, right so in and and this is where iot uh, is, is is very very uh, useful okay uh, not just uh, with all these agvs right uh, in fact a lot of these processes are being computerized or automated right now the engineers just need to turn key, turn the machine on, right? Let the processes run, especially on the back end of the semiconductor uh, processes. And then just monitor the efficiency or the output or the productivity of, of these, uh, these different modules uh, in, the, in the devices that they are looking at, yeah? Okay, so, and you know, uh, so what is smart, why is smart manufacturing so important? Now, one of the key things actually is called the, I'm sure you can think about, right? Any, if you think about, you know, logically, right? Uh, of course, you can use for predictive uh, maintenance or analytics, right? Uh, so that is why one of the key uh, uh, important use case of smart manufacturing uh, is actually to answer all the four questions. What is happening? What has happened? All right, so for example, uh, what is happening means is the production uh, uh, on schedule? All right, this way operational reports come into play. Then if there's some problem occur, right, then the, 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 uh, smart, man the smart management system should be able to describe to the manager, right, what has happened, all right, in terms, uh, in terms of numbers as internal processes as well. Then what can be done, you know, uh, di diagnose, what are the problems? Why did it happen, right? Is it because of some faulty uh, uh, components? Is it because of uh, some, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, processes that need to be tweaked, right? Some parameters that need to be tweaked. 
And, and the most amazing thing is because of all this data which is being generated in the entire uh, production uh, line, right? A lot of prediction can be actually done or can be can happen that can take place before the things happen. Uh, give you one example uh, with predictive analytics, right? In fact, the manager will be able to know uh, maybe which certain components of one of the production like need services. Maybe you know they have been um, they have been uh, 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 you know running continuously for the uh, nearing its uh, lifespan. So they may need to do some um, you know uh, overhaul or change of the uh, of the parts, right? So this is what we call predictive maintenance or analytics. But more importantly, and more with more insight, right? What this can be done can be further extended is actually into the supply chain optimization as well as asset tracking and asset optimization. And this has direct impact to the bottom line of the, you know, of the business, you know, uh, as, as you know, right, you know, if you do not monitor, if you do not manage your supply chain well, or you don't uh, so, uh, manage your inventory well enough, right? Number one is either, I, it's either you, you have things, you have things like, you know, you lost your inventory, you lost certain things, you lost your products, or you may find yourself in a situation where, oh, you do not have the uh, raw materials, you know, to, to make your products. Case in point, you know, recently what happened uh, after the COVID-19 was that a lot, there's a shortage of uh, uh, semiconductors. Why? Because uh, um, um, these uh, uh, capacities around the world has been actually earmarked for, you know, consumer as well as computers, uh, smart devices, smartphones, right? And when the automotive uh, semiconductor players come knock the door, ah, yeah, sorry, man. Uh, we do not have enough capacities for you already. And, you know, if, if you know, smart manufacturing which you know with iot is being um you know uh, uh uh executed or being implemented properly right i believe i personally believe that things events like this can you know can be re can be avoided or at least be managed improperly and that is why um you know uh, COVID-19, you know, really uh, play, I mean, has, you know, if you look at the bright side, it does open our eyes up to, you know, the need for a lot of automation and a lot of this um, smart manufacturing uh, implementation. Okay. And this, this is one of the use case for IoT. Yeah. And as I promised, as I mentioned before, um, what are the industries, you know, that really are adopting IoT or industry 4 in a huge, huge way? So according again to this uh, um, survey done by IoT Analytics back in, I think, 2020, yeah? So they, sur um, they survey uh, 150 uh, uh, manufacturing outfits around the world, big names, all right? And they came out with this report. They found out that actually the number one industry that is really adopting I Industry 4.0 in a huge way is, is none other than the automotive industry. Okay, like I mentioned before, um, you know, um, in in the in the process of making a car, right, most of most of the processes are actually automated because um, even screwing, you know, um, uh, 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 the parts together, putting the engines together, put uh, fixing the doors, right, most of it are being automated right now. And of course, for that, you need uh, machines that can actually measure precisely, that can position all these components uh, in, in, a, in a precise manner so they can fit into the, auto, into, into the product. Okay. Uh, the other than automotive, of course, as I mentioned before, computer, electronic, semiconductor is also the industry that is adopting industry 4.0 in a big way uh, because of, like I mentioned, it's because of the complexity of the process of the miniaturity of the components, um, as well as other factors that, you know, uh, to reduce human error, you know, um, or even, you know, statics. Uh, later on, one of the case studies were actually, uh, is a company that benefits in a big way, you know, uh, all the requirements for automated testing, right, in these industries. And of course, as you show here, metals and mining, interestingly, are also an industry that requires a lot uh, more automation uh, to, to, you know, to include industry 4.0. There are other, sorry, other industry would like those in those process industries, including oil and gas. And um, I also understand that oil and gas are adopting IoT in a, in a big way, uh, machinery, equipment manufacturing, energy, so on and so forth. 
Yeah. So you can see here, actually, this is just the beginning, right? Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that a lot of these uh, industries later on, right, this, this um, adoption of RLT is just going to go up uh, because of all the, uh, the reasons that I mentioned before, right? Uh, we need to automate a lot of things to increase productivity, to increase efficiency, to better use, to better make use of uh, uh, our resources, including human capital, uh, raw materials, uh, energy, and so on and so forth. And that is where Industry 4.0 plays a huge role. Okay, um, now, so uh, before we move into the topic about case studies in uh, Busan, Malaysia, let's talk about a, a little bit about just a quick one, global semiconductor players in IoT. Now, as I mentioned before, a lot of the layers in IoT stack, right, um, actually uh, there is open up, is opening a lot of opportunities on the green field. So there'll be a lot of names that we never heard before. And most of these are either you know, pre-IPO or they are privately held or they are held by uh, private equity firms. But I want to focus here on the right-hand side. Uh, um, this is a leading industry uh, vendors, IoT vendors back in 2019. I'm pretty sure it's still relevant today. Now I want to focus on the hardware layer where it includes microchips and I mentioned, uh, includes your MCU, the sensors, as well as the connectivity hardware. Okay, now, uh, so this is, this is just a snap the snapshot of the key players, the key semiconductor players in the industrial IoT value chain. All right, it, it, does, it doesn't mean that the IoT value chain only has these five players. In fact, there are multiple players uh, not included here, but these are the main ones that we track. And one of them is actually uh, Infineon, you know, uh, uh, ST Micro and XP and so on. You notice that, eh, how come all these semiconductor players are also like almost the same as the automotive uh, electronics, right? Actually, you're right. Um, as I mentioned, right, in the previous slide, right, because automotive is the forerunner or the leader in the uh, adoption of industry 4.0, that's why naturally a lot of these semiconductors players involved in the automotive, right, they are also involved in the IoT value chain. And one of the companies that uh, I really like is actually this company called Infineon. Now, um, so these are the different modules or the different segments on, in, the, in the IoT value chain, right? Including what I mentioned, the MCU, the uh, analog digital devices, the sensors, RF devices, connectivity uh, uh, modules, uh, power management modules, right? Differentiated memories, so on and so forth. All um, they're listed here. And Infineon ticks all the boxes. Uh, I think the next company is uh, ST My, ST Micro. Now, the reason why I want to show this to you is, you know, you have to find out, are there any companies in Malaysia? Now I may, because I only, I'm gonna show you three case studies only. So Takan, I mean, it's impossible for me to show showcase or to talk about all the companies in Malaysia listed in KYC that are involved, right, in the IoT value chain. So this slide is to help you, you know, maybe to further your own study or further your own research if you're interested to do a case study or to invest you know, in the IoT value chain. Look for those companies in Malaysia, you know, those uh, whether it's OSET or ATE you know, uh, players that you know, has any of these um, uh, companies as, F, as their major clientele. Now I'm sure you'll be able to find quite a number of companies, uh, dig out a lot, quite a number of semiconductor or technology companies in Malaysia that supply to these names, okay? Now, uh, of course, not all the um, semiconductor players, they will enjoy the same kind of profitability. In fact, um, I want to show you this slide uh, by uh, Roland Berger uh, Research. You know, um, I want to show you that actually um, not all the IoT uh, players or value chain will enjoy the same type of profitability across the board. Now, as you can see here, now this EBIT range uh, basically means the margin of the uh, uh, earnings before interest and tax margins, right? You can see actually for the vision sensors, uh, the, 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 the vision machines or the uh, machines that, that you know, are involved in visual inspection or the sensing, uh, I mean, uh, visual sensors, they actually enjoy the highest uh, uh, margin of profitability for the solutions. So we try not to, I mean, personally, I will not put too much effort on the suppliers or the producers of basic components, basic electronic components that just like, you know, the MCUs or the power management chips, right? I want to look for at least a subsystem or the solutions uh, 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 players of the IoT space. Um, so if they can, 
whether they are vision sensors or producers or actuators, as I mentioned before, or human uh, machine interface uh, 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 producers, right? In fact, you depending on how much you understand, you can look at uh, these, these different spaces of uh, opportunities, right? Now for myself, I'll be focusing a lot on the visual senses because as I, I believe there are a lot of opportunities uh, uh, on this layer here, the solutions for various industrial automation suppliers for vision sensors, okay? Now, of course, other than that, uh, actuated solutions are also very interesting. And then the human machine interface, but um, just unfortunately, not many players in Malaysia are involved in this uh, uh, part. In fact, our Malaysian uh, 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 ATE or, or players actually mostly are in this vision sensor or actuator space. Okay. So we are much further ado. I think the time is, wow, ooh, 9.20 already. Uh, so I'll be talking about three companies as I'm listed here. I'm just going to focus on the APE segment, which refers to the automated um, uh, testing equipment. Uh, the three companies that I'll talk about is Panamaster, uh, MI Techno Technovation, as well as QES. Now, um, disclaimer, I personally are invested in all of these companies, yeah. So please uh, take whatever I have with a pinch of salt. Uh, please don't simply go and uh, buy uh, tomorrow when the market opens. Please do your own research. Uh, basically, I'm just sharing with you what I know about these companies in the context of IoT. Now, um, it doesn't mean that all these three companies are, you know, uh, supplying solely or they are doing, you know, uh, producing things solely for IoT. No, that's not the case. It's just that, you know, in their business, you know, each, comp each group of companies have many different business segments, right? So I just picked these three uh, companies uh, to showcase their business segment that, you know, are involved in the IoT space. Now, then the next question will be, hey, David, are these the only three companies in KLS that are involved in IoT? Definitely no. In fact, there are a lot of other companies in KLS that are involved in the IoT value chain, which is not listed here as well. And in fact, a lot of uh, these private companies are also involved. Which are, they are not listed, right? They are privately held. A lot of these, uh, the list is even bigger, you know, of companies that are involved in the IoT value chain. Okay. Now, uh, just a word, uh, I think MIT Innovation, uh, the founder does not uh, categorize this company as APE segment. I think because MIT Innovation, the products, the machines that they produce, the equipment they produce are actually more meant for the front end of the wafer process, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the front end processes. So they don't really call themselves APE segment, huh? just, <laughs> just a fun fact. Okay, um, the first case study would be Penta Master. I talked about Panda Master last year when they talk about the uh, automotive electronics, okay? Uh, in uh, uh, I think back in October or November. So I'm not gonna talk too much about the background of the business. Now Panda Master, as you know, they have got two major arms. One is called the ATE, Automated Testing Equipment, about 68% based on the last financial year. See, they contribute to 68% of the revenue. So these ATE are used in, you know, uh, industry like semiconductor, photonics, which is your, uh, your LEDs, you know, uh, MEMS, uh, optics, so on and so forth. Then the other part, which is 32%, which is quite substantial. The revenue comes from the FAS segment, which stands for Factory Automation Solutions. Uh, so this is actually your robot. Uh, Pentamaster's robotic and automated solutions or systems, uh, the products will include the iARMS, iHub, um, MES. Okay, you can go to the website. Actually, these are all uh, I took from the website. Um, so the factory automation solutions AFS include things like you know material handling conveyor system. So these are sub modules which can be assembled together to form one whole uh, uh, a bigger system, right? Depending on what the customer wants. Um, uh, robotics, uh, they, you know, the robotics arm that they got the uh, manufacturing executive system, just like a dashboard, all right? Then, of course, they got their own AGV uh, solutions as well. Now, I understand personally, although they do not uh, publish them, uh, I think Panda Master, I believe Panda Master has some of the uh, multinational, uh, global multinational big tech companies as uh, uh, some of their clientele. All right. I'm not going to, I can't name them because uh, later on I'll get some trouble in, in, in trouble. But 
if you read their latest annual report, uh, Financial 2020, they actually highlighted the importance of this FAS segment, right, uh, for the business of Panda Master. In fact, they say that the increase in revenue last year, right, last year they had an in increment in revenue, uh, was attributed, was thanks to the growth adoption automation for Industry 4.0 and IoT and the processes that saw growing demand for their IARMS, all right. Then the growth of factory automation market size is also con contributed uh, uh, on the industrial automation, the need for industrial automation, as well as optimal resource utilization that I mentioned before, you know, uh, given that the uh, labor cost is getting more important, it's not efficient, but it's getting more, uh, sorry, more costly and the industrial uh, industry rapid shift towards smart manufacturing. Now, if you look at the re revenue contribution, right, uh, in the past one, two, three, four, five years, yes, the blue bar, which stands for the APE growth is actually growing, but in 2020, due to the pandemic, right, actually the APE segment took a dip, but thanks to the diversification, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, this uh, decision made by the, management back in all the way back in 2016 to focus more on factory automation solutions. Actually, the business wasn't too bad. In fact, the growth rate for these both segments are almost the same. ATE uh, segment was growing at about 24% per annum. Of course, that was uh, due to the, this dip in 2020. But the FAA segment is actually growing more steadily. Now, I'm sure that this is going to be more important. In fact, uh, based on their first quarter results, right, although they said that there was a slight dip, okay, but the importance of this segment, right, uh, it, this segment continues to witness robust demand, all right, uh, for its IAMS priority solutions. Uh, and then additionally, this FS, the FAS segment also contributed to, to the demand of the medical device. Now, if you, don't, if you haven't known yet, Pentamaster has a new uh, medical device segment, which is also growing, uh, although it's in the initial stage, but it should uh, become more important in the business in the future. Okay, so this is Panda Master. Um, their main business is not in uh, uh, industrial IoT or smart manufacturing or FAS, but it does uh, serve as a very good diversification strategy, in, especially you know when the ATE segment is not doing very well. Just uh, what that's uh, what happened in 2020. I think David, there is a typo at your uh, headline. It should be first. There was a typo, is it? Sorry about FY that. FY 2021. Uh. 2021. Uh. Am I right? Know? This one is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. Thank you. So this is F, uh, first Q 2021. So thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Shane. I will correct this later. Sorry about that, yeah? Okay. So next, I want to talk about the next case study, which is MI Technovation. Okay. Now, MI, um, it's not easy to get information from MI because, you know, the, the management is very, very secretive, very tight-lipped. But whatever I can gather from, you know, from reading uh, any reports, from attending uh, the AGMs and so on, right? Basically, MI is uh, involved in the design, development, manufacturing, and sale of WL. CSP sorting machines. These are wafer, wafer level uh, uh, processes, you know, basically on the, on the front end of the semiconductor uh, as, uh, value chain, right? Uh, so they are doing a lot of inspection and testing machines for the semiconductor industry. Now, MI is also involved in the, uh, okay, sales, uh, technical and support, but they also have this thing, this unit called the ARBU, all right? So the semiconductor is called SEBU, right? Uh, which stands for Semiconductor Equipment Business Unit that contributed almost all of their revenue back in 2020, 97%. Now, only 3% of the revenue is actually contributed by the ARBU, Automation and Robotics Business Unit. But even though this number is such a big difference, right? There are a lot of inter um, uh, inter segment revenue, uh, which because you know some of these automation uh, solutions are used in the several business unit, and they they will cancel each other out. You know when they when they come out with the quarterly or annual report. So even though it's three percent, right? I believe this is um, this part will also gain traction along the way. Now. Um, it is not easy to understand MI business. Uh, they got also a series MI, VI, AI, SI, right? Along the semiconductor process. But the ARBO is actually more um, simple. They just have the auto series cobalt uh, uh, as well as you know, the NHI, as you can see here. Um, so auto series is a specialized machines with AI connectivity for automation. 
All right, they, they can basically, I think, customize these machines, you know, to in the production line, you know, to automate some processes. Then they've got the Cobot series. Uh, this is like the station and mobile robots. Like the, I think this is their AGV solutions. Okay, and then they've got the NHI. I think the NHI is like the MES product by, by, by Pentamaster. And the other robotics um, uh, is actually meant for automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence solutions, meant for you know, semiconductor electronics industry, automotive, aerospace, smart city, science technology, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, all right, so this is MI's version of uh, you know uh, how 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 they will uh, partake in the growth of IoT. And interestingly, actually, um, the the founder actually the, the management actually talked a lot about industry 4.0 imp implementation as well as the focus of, of of the group right on this segment right. In fact, uh, based on the latest quarter result of this one, I. I Type properly already. Yeah. Automation and robotics segment for Industry 4.0 is one of the group's key focus business segment. Uh. Although contribution is very small, but it is their key business uh, focus, uh, focus for the business segment. The, the demand for automotive solution as well as smart fence rate systems stays very strong, especially for the semiconductor business unit. Okay, and and uh, I think in the in that quarter, uh, the the first unit of a fully integrated system, the Auto and Cobalt series uh, for wafer level package die sorting process was delivered to the customer. So I think this explains why the uh, revenue contribution is so small. I believe I personally believe um, this will grow uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, in, in, over. I mean uh, down the lane. Uh, in fact, not uh, not just the autobotic, the auto or the cobalt series. Uh, in fact, for MI, they also produce a lot of. Sorry, uh, let me just zoom in here. Uh, wait, zoom, zoom, zoom. My goodness. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. In fact, in India, semiconductor series, right? So this MI and BI series, they also uh, produce you know, solutions for the IoT industry, Bluetooth, near field sensing, sensors, applications, which require high functionality, mobility, and low power consumption in small form factors. In other words, these are solutions that support the IoT and MI, you know, are already doing that right now. So that is why I believe this segment will grow just like what's happening to uh, Pentamaster over the years uh, because Pentamaster, when they started out, right, the, uh, I think, okay, la, they started out with a good footing, la, all right, uh, quite, quite big already. Okay, so um, interestingly, MI, the share price has corrected almost 50% from its peak recently. So I think... <laughs> Uh, disclaimer, I think there could be a good opportunity for there. So worth to take a look, right? Okay, so that's about MI. Now, the next uh, case study is actually more interesting, uh, personally as well, right? But um, <laughs> uh, ironically, uh, this company QES uh, is, do not have uh, such a high allocation in, our, in my portfolios compared to the other two, all right? In fact, I, 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 so I, I put out my disclaimer first. I am personally invested uh, in QS. I think it is now about 3% of my entire portfolio, 3%, yeah? So um, earlier on, I talked about, you know, the industries that has adopted uh, IoT or, uh, sorry, IoT or industry 4.0 in a big way, right? So this includes automotive, includes electronic semiconductor and metal mining, right? And guess what? QES is involved in all of these three industries, yeah? Okay, so a little bit about QES. QES, um, their business model is very simple. It's quite easy to understand, not like uh, the other two. Uh, so basically, QES has three uh, different business segments, uh, the distribution services, as well as manufacturing. Although here I put equipment, but uh, they have uh, renamed it to manufacturing recently. Yeah. So as you can see, based on the latest quarter result, uh, about 67% or more than two thirds of the sales or the re revenue is contributed by the distribution unit. Um, about 14% is coming from the manufacturing of, of equipment. Yeah. And what... Um, what, who are some of QES customers? Very interesting. Although they are pretty small company, all right, pretty new kid in the block, right? They do serve a huge range of uh, multinational clients, especially in the semiconductor space. So uh, under their belt, they've got uh, clients like, uh, they've got companies like Infineon, Sutera, NXP, ST Micro, Texas Instrument, as you know, uh, uh, their clients in the semiconductor industry. Now, guess what? 
Remember earlier on in a few slides ago, I talked about the global IIoT semiconductor players, right? These are some of the names. I'm sure you find some of the names on that table, isn't it? Okay. So other than semiconductor, they also uh, have uh, automotive as well as E&E, uh, &E, electronic and electrical appliances. Uh, these are just the three main um, uh, segments, right? Of course, they are, have other uh, clientele as well, not listed here. These are basically the three main uh, clientele that they serve across key sectors with more than 240,000 uh, customers across the region. Basically, they are international supplier as well. Okay, um, this is the old article back in 2020. I think today QES uh, also has, there's another article by in the edge about QES then that they're riding the digital boom. And I think QES aspiring to be an important player in the equipment space, yeah? So, uh, and what do they mean about equipment space? Uh, one of the solutions that they provide, you know, is actually for the semiconductor industry. And a lot of QES uh, machines is actually geared towards I IoT as well as smart, smart manufacturing. And in fact, as a solutions provider, QES is already offering industry uh, 4.0 ready equipment uh, that you know involves around the GDNT, which we call geometric dimensioning and tolerancing measurement uh, uh, systems, to non-destructive ins uh, inspection, to contact and non-contact measurement system. And these are very important because remember I talk about a lot of manufacturing process that require high automation and very um, um, uh, minimum uh, human intervention, right? And this is where a lot of these machines will be uh, very useful, right? Because we don't want, we want to reduce human error and whatnot, right? Okay, I uh, talk about lights out. So a lot of these um, uh, machines, the solutions is actually ready for lights out manufacturing process already. Uh, again, of course, you know, we, because they are I, I industry 4.0 already. So they have, they're, of course, they have, they'll, they have uh, centralized cloud uh, processing capabilities, cloud computing management control, right? You can manage uh, the process via mobile or tablet, so on and so forth as a control dashboard uh, kind of thing, right? Now, um, what I show you in front is a typical aspiration of, of how, you know, the QS solutions can help uh, businesses or manufacturers um, you know, um, uh, gear to gear themselves towards industry 4.0. So on the left is uh, what it's showing is a typical convent, uh, typical production floor in the semiconductor space where you know you have you know all these uh, um, engineers walking around. Yes, there are some form of automation. You've got robotic arms. Uh, uh, basically, this is a, a wafer uh, production uh, system. Okay, uh, they've, they've got programmable logic controllers here talking to each other. All right, but in the pure industry 4.0 uh, implementation, right? You can see that basically there are no human, there are no engineers on the floor. In fact, you can just turn out the lights. That's why it's called lights up production floor. And everything is connected to the cloud. Uh, instead of just a wired connection, right? Everything can is maybe connected wirelessly to the cloud, either through 4G, uh, sorry, 5G, or some of the uh, low power wide area network uh, connectivity. And all these processes, including the wafer stocking uh, uh, stockers, including automated uh, uh, post uh, inspection uh, uh, processes can be done by QES machines listed here. Now, uh, of course, I know it's very small. You can't see. I, if you want to know about uh, this company, right, do go to their website. They actually uh, list out all the machines that they uh, carry under their uh, uh, portfolio. Okay, so this is just one of the solutions and, you know, I mentioned QS is also involved in the metal and, and mining. In fact, um, they do not produce, QS do not, does not produce these machines, but they distribute the machines, uh, these solutions by Herzog. Herzog is a leading supplier of manual and automated system for quality control and primary industry in quality assurance and sample preparation. So this include the steel uh, uh, industry as well as the uh, mining industry. So you know whereby you can, you can actually, after the samples are put in, right, you can, uh, all the processes are automated. There's no uh, human uh, intervention. So again, as I mentioned, QS do not, of course, QS do not uh, produce these machines, but they distribute these machines for under the Herzog brand, all right, in, uh, uh, to their customers. Okay, and, and last but not least, I want to talk about actually a recent uh, development, business development of QES, whereby they took over all of Nikon's industrial meteorology business in Malaysia. Now, although they only took over the business in Malaysia, they 
also uh, they can they can actually distribute these solutions. Metrology basically refers to you know uh, measurement, industry measurement of, uh, of of the system, right? They can distribute to the clients in Malaysia, I think, to Vietnam, to Philippines, to Indonesia, so on and so forth. Yeah, and of course, um, actually. At first, when I, when I saw this, I also don't really quite understand that. I actually went to the Nikon Metro, Metrology website, right? And I've got, I was actually quite dumbfounded with all the solutions that they have, you know? Um, so Nikon Metrology offers solutions for all industry, all types of industrial uh, measurements, including inspection and quality assurance for, you know, uh, automotive, for aerospace, for any sort. I think you name it, they, they've got the solutions for, for it. So they've got four type, four major uh, business categories, uh, which includes the ABDIS, uh, I think it stands for Accurate Precision uh, Dimensioning Scanning. Uh, basically, you know, this is the ABDIS uh, machine here. Basically, it's a laser to scan, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think based on the description here, is body in white inspection uh, for the cars. Now, body in white refers to the car, um, you know, whereby the, it's, it's just a frame uh, without the engine, without the uh, without the glass doors, uh, uh, windows, without without the metal sheets, right? So basically, it's just a frame, and and of course there will be a lot of screws, a lot of holes in these cars, uh, and you they, the machines, the system need to know, uh, need to ensure that all these are in place, are aligned properly, so that they can move on to the next production uh, process, which is to fit in all these. Um, uh, components, other other car components after the body in white stage. Yeah, of course they've got other automation uh, solutions like the CMM, um, the coordinated uh, measurement machines. They've got extra inspection automatic handlers. They've got uh, inline uh, computerized tomography inspections, and so on and so forth. And this is catered across different types of industries. Now, of course, I'm not in the business, so I can't really talk. Uh, I don't really. I, I may not be able to talk about the solutions uh, convincingly. So I'm going to use the help of a YouTube video. Um, I'm just, just, just going to play a couple of minutes for you. This is now uh, Nikon's, let me check if I, oops, how come, ah, okay. This is Nikon's uh, app, this uh, laser ra radar, as I mentioned, for the automotive. Now you can go to YouTube and watch it on yourself. Let me just play a couple of minutes for you, yeah? Okay, so let me share my sound. Yes. Okay, thank you. So as you can see here, this is the app, this uh, machine here. Uh, it's basically a laser scanner. They can scan the body in white frame of the car to make sure that everything is in place before they move on to the next uh, uh, process and the next step. They can be mounted on the robotic arms uh, with an inline production system or they can be spent alone on their own. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, so you can have a look at this YouTube video here. I just put the link here. Uh, maybe Chun Sen can share the link on the chat group later, or you can just Google it. Just go to YouTube, uh, look for Nikon app. This and you can you know you can look at you know the uh, solutions for aerospace for automotive segment and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's about QES, you know. Um so Q this is uh QS district. QS do not manufacture this product. They just uh, they distribute the Nikon range of solutions, right? Including uh, the app disc, including the CMM automation series, uh, including STVs, inline uh, CT inspection, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's I guess nine forty two. Just gum gum uh, for Q and A later. So just a recap. Um, the case studies presented here is does not mean that these companies are uh, cater only to IoT, yeah, uh, but they do have a business. They do they are involved in the IoT, whether in a big way like um, uh, Panda Master or in a small way like MI Technovation, but growing definitely over the uh, uh, over time, or you have a 
uh, a semiconductor, sorry, a, a ATE player like QES that distribute products related to IIoT and even makes their own equipment to, that, that uh, you know, supports uh, the implementation of IIoT for the clientele. Okay, so on that note, um, Shane, back to you. Thanks for, I, I hope I wasn't too fast because I've got really got a lot of slides to cover tonight. Yeah. Yes, uh, that was a very mind-blowing session to me, uh, at least. So if it is equally blind, uh, mind-blowing to you, uh, type yes. Let me know if this session has been uh, mind-blowing to you. Uh. Type yes if it is. Okay. All right. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah, I think questions we all are... <laughs> learned a great deal. <laughs> let's, wow. Let's see mm. I easily see like 50, 60 years. <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. Okay. If you like this kind of session, uh, do let us know in the feedback so we can arrange more of these kind of sessions for you. All right. For any questions for David, write in the Q&A box, then we will address them. Uh, we only have 15 minutes left to address your questions. All right, so the first question is Kevin asked, like, will the current global sh chip shortage derail the advancement of IoT? Um, well, derail is a, is a very strong word, Kevin. Um, I would say that the global semiconductor, the chip shortage may delay or may disrupt a little bit uh, in a very short time. But I personally believe that this problem will be resolved very soon. In fact, um, I have been talking to a few uh, CEOs or senior management of our local OSAT and ATE companies. They mostly share the same view uh, in that you know, this uh, global industry uh, uh, shortage is, is going to be resolved pretty soon. Uh, in fact, if you follow the news, um, China, you know, uh, countries like China, um, Taiwan and uh, Korea, right? They are actually going towards the, you know, wafers are produced in eight inch right now, right? So eight inch, you can imagine, right? There's uh, so much you can produce in the number of chips in the eight inch, eight, eight inch wafer. They are going to actually spearhead the production uh, of 12 inch wafer. So just, it's basically the same product, same processes, just that, you know, you tweak a little bit, to, in, to, to, to enhance your, 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 your processes to, to be able to make 12 inch. So just by doing that, right, you've got 50% more, uh, more uh, uh, capacity already because eight to 12 is four, right? So four out, four over eight is 50%. So you, are being, you can boost your production, uh, your productivity by 50% just by producing 12 inch. So although it takes time, I don't think it will derail IoT implementation. I think the, it may have a short, uh, a very brief uh, disruption, but that's it. Yeah, Kevin, thanks. All right, so uh, the next question is, I think there were a few questions on great tech. Like I think okay. uh, investors are concerned about the drop share price, like 7% today. Would you, can you give some comment? Great tech drop how much? 7%? Uh? Yeah, <laughs> I think it dropped 10% in the morning and then uh, towards the afternoon okay. session, it recovered back. Yes, actually, you are right. Uh, I'm, I think I know why there's a lot of questions about Great Tech because Great Tech has positioned themselves, um, I think, very nicely as a player uh, in many, in, uh, across many verticals, including uh, automation, including uh, um, you know, uh, EVs, including batteries, right? Uh, one of the, I think the key reason for the price to drop is actually the deal with the Lost Town. Uh, Lost Town is a startup firm uh, based in the US that, uh, you know, they do uh, 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 electric trucks, right? And apparently, uh, Great Tech supposed to have a, a lot of big contracts with them and they suddenly they say that, you know, Lost Town do not have enough cash, you know, to, to fulfill the obligations. So I think that's why. Uh. But that aside, uh, actually, Great tech. Uh, I, I've been to the factories before. A few of them uh, uh, when they have an uh, fund managers and analyst briefing, right? I was quite blown away. Um, in fact, that time we only saw the the plant for the these uh, solar panels, the the solar frames, right? But actually, uh, great great techs. Um, uh, how to say their 
their strength is actually in the automation process. Okay, so that should play quite well uh, along the IoT uh, frame, but unfortunately, uh, for the reasons that I, for I cannot share, I, it is not in my watch list. Uh, I do not study great tech in detail, <laughs> but I do understand that they are quite a, a promising player right, in the uh, IoT uh, value chain. That much I can say. Mm, okay. Um, there are also questions on uh, TSMC, uh, mm. even though it's not uh, listed here in Bursa. Okay. But then uh, the, the question is, will TSMC be a competitor to Malaysian companies uh, since this is the, the world largest pure play foundry? I think no industry, in, no companies in the world, including <laughs> Intel, can, can compete with TSMC. <laughs> uh, um, how to say this uh, dominance uh, in the wafer manufacturing. But that said, that said, um, you know, this day, uh, recently Malaysia, we have with this company called, come on, what's the company that DNX is, is buying over again? Sutera. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, Sutera, they are not as advanced as TSMC. Uh, they are perhaps the only uh, pure wafer play uh, producer uh, play in Malaysia, but they do not produce advanced uh, notes uh, like what TSMC is doing. Uh, maybe I think they are doing like 200 nanometers, which is actually quite quite good already. Uh, in fact, a lot of my MCUs or a, prof, a lot of power management chips do not require very high uh, high end uh, uh, process notes like what TSMC is doing, like you know the seven nanometers, the ten nanometers, right? Most of the power management chips, most of a lot of these semiconductors require, uh, uh, require uh, not so high end, uh, like even the 200, uh, 100 nanometer uh, processor. So, so yeah, I don't think anyone can compete with uh, TSMC for now. Like in, even SMIC, even Global Foundries, uh, Intel is trying very hard, but I think they still got a long way to go. So Malaysia players, uh, is in a very are in a very special situation to support this industry, and interestingly, um, some of the companies that are, I think one of the companies I mentioned just now, MI Technovation, I think they are trying to gear towards that uh, uh, that market segment. In fact, um, MI Technovation has set up a facility in Taiwan, uh, in Taipei. Uh, the area is called Xingzhu, uh, and it's very, very near to the TSMC uh, facility. So maybe you can dig. Uh, I, I do not, uh, Shane, I don't know who asked that question. So perhaps the, the, the participant can actually find out more about that. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Innovation yeah actually, expansion in Taiwan. Yeah. Instead of thinking TSMC as Malaysian competitors, uh, I think we have to dig deeper to see who supplies to TSMC, who, yes, who, who don't, provides don't services. It, yeah, to try not to look at it from a competition <laughs> point of view, but or how we can complement, how our tech sector can complement that com uh, I mean, uh, large company like TSMC. Mm. Not just TSMC, by the way, you can also look at the IDMs, the independent device manufacturers like Broadcom, like Infineon, like SC Micro that I mentioned earlier on. Mm. Yeah, that, okay. that should be the way. Sufian would like to ask, like, what are, uh, what are the competitive edge of uh, Mi Technovation, Panda Master, and uh, QES compared to companies like Great Tech, Sutera, and others? Mm, we are not really comparing Apple to Apple, uh, because they they each of these companies cater to different industry, different clientele, different segments of the um, semiconductor value chain. Um, Penta Master are, are, are dealing a lot with uh, you know vision inspection machines. Um, I think that like I mentioned last year, right? They're also into Vicel, uh, uh, these LED products. They are into medical as well. Now, but MI Technovation, um, the founder, the management is actually quite. I, I have high respect for them. They are actually quite visionary. In fact. MI is one of the few tech companies in Malaysia that are investing in a big way uh, uh, by in overseas uh, uh, you know, ventures, right? Uh, MI is actually going towards, uh, you know, that, that, as I mentioned before, they are setting up, you know, a, a facility in Taiwan. They have, they are already have one hub, they have one uh, facility in Korea. I think they are going to China soon. In fact, uh, other companies like QES as well. QES recently, um, set up, uh, I think they just engaged two distributors in Hong Kong or China to actually tackle the Chinese market. 
So it's hard to compare each of these single players uh, uh, side by side uh, on, 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 one, on one angle because again, like I mentioned, each of them cater to different segment of the value of the semiconductor value chain, the processes, different clientele. So I, a lot of investors in Malaysia, right? They tend to, when they do research on tech companies, they tend to put a blanket across all these players. They say, oh, uh, for example, uh, QES, okay, the competitor is uh, Vitrox. Actually, no. Um, both of them, they do different things. Uh, Penta Master, uh, uh, their, their competitor is Great Tech. Actually, not true, uh, true and not so true as well because each of them really cater for very specific segments of the uh, entire semiconductor value chain. But if you ask me whether I, uh, you know, um, my confidence or based on my own personal opinion, right, what what, what do I think about the management, right? So apart from these three names that I mentioned, right, probably uh, some of the uh, uh, ATE players that I have high respects on is actually Vitrox. In fact, I would love so much to put Vitrox as my case study again, uh, I mean, in this presentation, but due to the one hour frame, right, I can only talk about three. Uh, so hopefully next time when I come back here, I can talk more about other companies like Vitrox. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is, does uh, QS patent their technology uh, are you aware okay qs uh, um patent have patents for the manufacturing products for the equipment but not for the uh, products that they are distributing mm, okay uh, in fact uh equipment the many the equipment business right the patents is not so much about the, on the hardware but it is more important for the software as if you ask around right if you are invested long enough in the technology space, right? You understand, right? Actually, hardware just plays a role. The more important uh, element here is actually the software. How you have to build a software that can actually, uh, you know, uh, 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 power up your machines uh, together with the entire uh, ecosystem. That is more important. Yeah. Okay, uh, so can, for, for that, they definitely have patterns. Yeah, thank okay. you. Can Tay ask the next question is, is MacLean involved in industrial things? Oh, MacLean. Uh, Ken, uh, I'm very sorry. I don't know what MacLean does, but I used I, I seem to recall that MacLean is a Goreng stock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe uh, you can, I, I'll, I'll Google about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, David would like to ask, like, what is the future prospect of DNEX uh, when uh, Foxconn decided to join them? <laughs> uh, uh, well, have any view? Um, a lot of things are unknown yet. In fact, uh, DNEX is going to have a in analyst briefing next week. It was supposed to be today. Uh, sorry, uh, yesterday or today, but then it was post it was a retime to next week. Um, so. I can't answer that right now without knowing more in detail, but I can just tell you one thing. It's very exciting. All right. It's very, very exciting for, 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 for I personally am very excited about the prospects, but whether the new management that came in uh, as well as the new stakeholders that are going to bring in, right? I think I'm sure they'll bring in some Chinese partners as well, right? Whether they can execute, they can successfully execute and turn around the business of Zutera, uh, to be a successful, you know, wafer level uh, uh, um, uh, producer in Malaysia, right? That is still a long way to go. It's not just about pumping money. If it's just if money can solve everything, right? China will be already very advanced today for uh, especially with the SMIC. But it's not only uh, about capital. It's really about learning the the learning curve. So I think it will take time. Give it time. Um, I am more optimistic, so hopefully, I Malaysia will be proud one uh, couple of years on the road and say, "Oh, we also have our waiver, uh, a very advanced waiver production unit." Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kim Ming asked, like Penta and me have shown disappointing quarter for a few quarter result for a few quarters. Uh, how soon do you think these two companies can show promising quarters? Well, um, I do not work in this company, so I don't know. Um, definitely. You know, in a business, this is part and parcel. You know, sometimes you have good quarters, sometimes you have not. But I think these are just temporary setback. Um, all the case studies that I mentioned before and all the hints that I gave you guys, right, about what kind of companies I invest in, right, are really for the long term. Now, um, so although when we say we are long term, right, sometimes when the price goes up too fast, too high, in, short, in too short a time, right, we tend to take profit as well. 
Then when the t- prices come down, right, and then at, at the at the level which we think is becoming cheap again, we will buy back. And the reason for to do this is to actually uh, to to reduce our average balance cost. So, what will happen in the f- uh, following quarters, I really do not know. Uh, I hope that the market will give me opportunities that they will, they will send the price cheap enough for me to buy. In fact, um, I, I, I don't mind to share with you that I'm looking back to buy, I'm looking to buy back all these three companies that I show you in front of you, Panda Master, MI and QES. Yes, I cannot <laughs> wait to buy some more. <laughs> Hopefully the market will give me cheaper. Okay, disclaimer, no yeah. any buy call, okay? Uh, they are, they uh, are, sorry, sorry, disclaimer. <laughs> I would like to ask, like, how do you view industrial uh, revolution 4.0 exposure in for the Malaysia environment currently? And what possibility do you think can happen next? Like, which area does company in Malaysia have the advantage to be involved in this industrial IoT from your point of view? Okay, I think Cairo has a very, very good question. I'm not, not sure Cairo as Az- Azar Salim. Okay, right. Thank you for that question, Cairo. Very intuitive. Now, um, and this is my personal opinion, uh, and bear, bear in mind, uh, I am not a semi, I'm, n- I'm not a, uh, an engineer in any of these companies, right? But from an investor's point of view, uh, I believe that Malaysia is still at infancy stage on the IIoT, all right? Uh, in fact, there's a lot of room to grow. Now, let me give you an example why I say this. Now, just now, do you remember the video that I shared with you about Nikon app D solution, right? Now, um, so after I dug up some information, all right, for uh, doing more research about uh, doing interviews with the stakeholders, all right, some of the, uh, I found out that actually, eh, yes, it's very, it's very good, but the app this is not really used in Malaysia or even ASEAN countries because. Um, these solutions are mainly used in developed countries, you know, like you know the Western world or the uh, like in, in 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 Europe, right? But that said, right, I believe that this will happen eventually in countries like Malaysia, and you know that um, as we know, we cannot rely on labor too much on cheap labor anymore. We cannot be become too dependent on it, right? Not just you know in plantation, not just in construction, but especially in manufacturing as well. Um, so I think it will come where you know more and more companies will adopt the industrial uh, internet of things in their processes. Uh, of course, the return on investment they they still first they still need to um, how how do you say this um, go through the due diligence, go through the modeling of the capex opex right, and make to make sure that it is actually worth the investment that the ROI you know is is achievable within the uh, prescribed period, and on top of that, uh, and this is my personal view, please don't take it uh, 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 please don't take it the wrong way. I think the Malaysian government agencies are not doing enough to um, to push this agenda forward. In fact, a lot of things can be done um, to. To, to, to rejuvenate, sorry, to accelerate the adoption of internet of industrial internet of things, smart manufacturing automation in Malaysian manufacturing uh, 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 sector. Yes, the government say that they want to push automation, they want to win the dependency on uh, uh, foreign labor, but yet on the other hand, they are not doing enough, they're not pushing enough policies, they're not enforcing or, or uh, 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 enough uh, incentive to to incentivize the manufacturers to adopt, to embrace uh, IoT. So I personally hope as a grateful Malaysian, I hope that this will change very soon because if it does not change, then I'm very sadly said, I think we are going to lose out to our neighbors, including Indonesia, including Thailand, including Vietnam. So I really hope that this will happen. So I, I feel you, Cairo. <laughs> I hope that we can really up our, you know, pull out our stocks and really head towards this very soon. Otherwise, we will just be left behind in the in this race. Yeah. Mm, okay. I think uh, Miti is swamped with all the applications to open the business. <laughs> so no time to look into this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, joke, joke aside, this is a joke. Okay? <laughs> yeah, but joke aside, I really hope that this will happen uh, because this is a problem that we are seeing quite... Uh, for 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 many for for many years already. It's not just recently. All right. Uh, I think we have uh, reached the end of the question and answer session. So okay. Thank you so much, cool. Lady.
let me uh, share my screen for a bit. Yeah, all right. Right, next as usual is Bursa Academy. Yeah, so if you have not know about Bursa Academy, please head over to www.bursaacademy.bursamarketplace.com. It is a comprehensive one-stop e-learning platform that aims to help you with a continuous and holistic learning journey. There's uh, investing articles, uh, resources, uh, videos, uh, webinar recordings that you can find there uh, for your own uh, reading uh, pleasure and also learning purpose. All right, so for our next webinar, okay, we are doing this perangkaan portfolio patoh syariah yang seimbang, okay? It's happening this Friday, 11 June, uh, 8 to 10 o'clock. So we have given you the registration link on YouTube and also on Zoom. So please head over to uh, register if you want to learn how to build a uh, syariah compliant portfolio, a balanced syariah compliant portfolio, okay? So it, as the title suggests, it will be conducted in uh, BM. All right, so we'll see you on this Friday if you want to learn how to build a balanced portfolio. All right. Okay. So, uh, if you want to see David, okay, David has another session coming up next Wednesday. Okay, that oh will yeah, next Wednesday, yeah. Psychology of investing. Okay, mm. so if you want to see uh David uh do a uh, watch out for our emails and also uh, on Bursa Academy, whereby we'll sh uh, share you when is the next session and how you can register for it. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining today's sessions until the end of this uh, webinar. We uh, uh over. We uh, passed the time for a little bit, but uh, thank you for paying attention. I know that you take time out of your busy schedule to be here. I hope that it, uh, this webinar was well worth your time. Uh -huh. With that, uh, have a pleasant rest of the day, everybody. And thank you, David, for sharing with us your insight into the industrial internet of things. Okay, thank you and good night. Yeah, good night, everybody.